Hello and welcome to Man's Talk. I am Tammy Simmons. And I'm Carla Garrick. And it's cold out. It, yep, it, it is. is. It's winter. I mean, it's finally it's fu- winter. We've had such a mild winter. There's it's, really been no It's complaints. funny because Dan says to me the other day, he goes, I just hate February. And I go, but we're in January. He goes, no, we're not. We're in February. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely February. Um, but, I mean, I know I've said it before, but I hate February because my birthday's in February. And I used to have pool parties oh, for my birthday. And, and now, now I got, have... Like, snow. You know, New Hampshire in February is probably not our finest month. February is probably the worst month. I'm hoping that maybe I can get away, go down to Mexico or Aruba or something. But um, it's really hard to plan at the moment. It's frustrating because I'm like you like to go to Aruba or Mexico. What what you can do today might not be what you can do six weeks from oh, now, so since, how do you plan? You know, since I've had several flights canceled over the past year, um, but didn't you hear, I guess all good. the all good. Democratic governors magically, yeah. as I yeah. predicted after the inauguration. It's amazing. It's COVID's a, over. It's a There's New nothing Year's the miracle. government can do about it. Cuomo, who's that other guy? New, Governor Newsom of California lifted mo- a lot of their restrictions. They've been like literally locked down for 10 months and suddenly, I mean, last week we were watching... Oh, Fauci said last week, we've plateaued, it's over, it's all good. But, but also last week, Joe mm. Biden said, we can't stop the trajectory that this is on. Uh, Governor... Or Governor kind of like everyone who understands science Anybody? and who actually understands how viruses works and who said studied all a- the things, have been saying for a year. So, you know what? Instead of being bitter about it... I'm not bitter. Welcome I just, to welcome the to right life, side. Right? Welcome to life. Welcome to life. Let's get on with living it. it. I can't ever say it. Hydro, hydroxychloroquine uh, is now, is now medicine. approved medicine, yep. even though we berated Donald Trump oh, for yeah. even pr- remotely suggesting it. And all sorts of doctors lost their jobs and were banned from social media and all sorts of things because they were quacks. And now... Ta-da! You Miracles. Know, so, so yeah. And, like, one of my favorite things is to do the side-by-side headlines. Yeah. So we should oh. actually start to get those and, and it's just crazy. show people. Because I think sometimes, well, you know, people just... They forget. Uh, well, they forget. Or they're... They, I think everyone's in denial, right? Mm-hmm. So if you create two camps and you make these both echo chambers, yes. then basically... What I want to do is I want to talk to everyone, right, so that we're all on the same page so that we can say it's kind of crazy that we said all of these things six months ago and now we're saying the same things six months later. Nothing has changed except the propaganda messaging, right? right? So what I really want people to do is to start to understand I don't think it's this left-right paradigm. It's not. It's a paradigm of control and control freaks so, and free people. And that's what we should be talking about. You know, about. even though you're not supposed to fall asleep with technology because it's supposed to not make you sleep well, we fall asleep with technology in our house. Um, so last night I, we were listening to um, one of Scott Adams' episodes and apparently Scott Adams is also a, a hypnotist, which I thought was interesting. He, oh, that he's makes the creator sense, of yeah. Dilbert, which mm-hmm. is amazing. But he, but So he knows a lot about how things make you think and he was talking about um he got in a twitter argument over um it doesn't even matter what the context was but he said oh he was arguing about whether or not um that trump never actually said you should drink bleach because he didn't ever actually say you should drink bleach and anybody who actually listened and were paying attention to what he was talking about he was talking about light therapy as a as a possible right so So he's going back and forth with this otherwise intelligent person who said no, kept saying this part about the bleach, and Scott said, well, where? And he goes, it's right here in this article. And the guy shared the link to the article, and the article mentions nothing about bleach. And he goes, so you have to wonder, like, when people are saying, but here's my, here, it's right here, but then what they're talking about actually isn't Isn't right there. That he goes, that's not that's not intentional misleading. That's not. He goes, a lot of that is literally cognitive dissonance and people not I being mean, able to actually say that, like you can show them and they still think it says something different. Um, and I mean, I don't know if this is entirely similar, but they call it the Mandela effect. Mm. Right. 
And where that came from is, I guess maybe 10 years ago was when it sort of came up. Everyone was saying, uh, oh, but we thought Nelson Mandela had been dead for years. And at the time he was still alive, yeah. he has passed now. But um, so they started calling it this thing where people like were, will, will internalize something and, and be like, they, this is how it is. And then even when you're like, no, really, that person is not dead. They're like, no, he is. Oh, you they know. still think he is. Yeah. So, you know, so I, there is a lot of that that plays into a lot of these. Like when you're saying comparing headlines, the one that where the one that brought my attention about when Biden said there's no way to stop this trajectory. Now, this one, I don't think is what we're discussing, but the, the comparing headlines were in campaign mode, Joe Biden was saying, Donald Trump's killing millions of people. He's not doing anything. He's I failing. Have, I have a I plan. Have I'm going to stop it. I'm going to whatever. And then and as then soon <laughs> as he's inaugurated, he yeah. says, there's nothing you can do to stop it. And I thought, huh, imagine that. And really, so like, I just want to make it clear, like I'm pointing these things out because I'm pointing out hypocrisy. It, yes, it's as not just one. To, it's this side versus this right. side. What I hope people can start to learn and really look at is kind of like who's spinning what, what at and me why? and what for, for what reason. Right. Right? It's always it so follows that, that same thing as follow the money is often a legitimate course that you should right. take because there's usually some incentive why people are doing certain things. Like why are they doing that? I don't know. Well, who's to gain? <laughs> who's to benefit? Yes. I mean, yes. Always who 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 benefits. So actually, that brings up an interesting point, because I had submitted testimony today. Uh, there are several bills that are being heard. And depending on when you guys see this at home, you may have missed it. But there'll be more chances to do it. So the one today that I was uh, uh, that I'm testifying on is it the ombudsman bill. OK, so this is a right to know bill. Right to know, of course, is a statewide uh, coalition, left, right, bipartisan, nonpartisan, right. all of that, of just people who think that we would be better served in our democracy if we actually knew what the government was doing. So we want open, transparent, accessible, and responsive government, right? So this ombudsman is supposed to help because currently the only way things work is if I file a right to no request, yes. And for whatever reason, sometimes it's malicious. Most of the time, I think it's just people who don't know and they don't want to make a decision. So they just say no. <laughs> the only way you can kind of force that process to go on is you have to go to superior court. That's expensive. Right. It's intimidating. And, and it's, it's time, cons it time consuming. Silly. It's all of that stuff, right? So maybe in 2017, they commissioned a task force. They all met. They came up with this bipartisan idea that if we create an ombudsman's uh, office out of the, I believe it's going to come out of the Secretary of State, okay? Okay. Because they had to find the budget somewhere. Yeah. Then instead of people immediately going to court, they can go to this ombudsman instead. The person can say, yes, release the information. No, we need to redact a little bit. Or, oh, hell no, you can't see that. <laughs> right. So, so hopefully it'll streamline things. So in my testimony, I had mentioned um, that uh, some departments are on record as saying that filing a right to no request is a hostile act by citizens. Ooh. And I was like, uh, and I so distinctly remember that. So I had sent the, the testimony around to, to Right to Know members just to be like, this is what I'm sending in. Anyone have any comments? And someone asked back, oh, you say here on record, what's the record? And I was like, oh, that's a good question. And, I, and, and so I started Googling, and I was like, I know I read it somewhere. Right, I, I couldn't right. find it in those of five course. minutes, right? And then I was like, oh, maybe someone told me that. Right. So, you know, I was like, okay, when I go to testify, I should probably clarify that. because words matter, right? right? So if you're and saying... You're, and there wasn't an intention to be misleading. It yeah. was just, oh, I... And, and I know it happened. It's just a question of, you know, was it... I, I believe it's the same woman who's been doing a lot of whistleblowing and really good right to know work mm. in, in Nashua. I was going to say, in Nashua. And, um, you know, and I, I think she told me, and it may even have been in that context of when they sent, do you remember this? When they sent police yeah. officers to the lady's house on a Saturday to ring the doorbell and be like, hey, you shouldn't file so many right to know requests. Now, I don't know about anyone back home, but if someone showed up in my house and two uniformed police officers, I would deem that intimidation. So um, I think it was in that context. But anyway, that is a super long lead in. That's okay. 
for you were going to well, tell I, us how to testify. Well, we were talking about this last <laughs> week with all this, you know, not being in person or half being in person and Zoom and <laughs> oh, I don't know. Talk about no, this? we're not going to talk. <laughs> Carla and I participated in what was an attempt to have about 375 people oh. in a Zoom meeting on Saturday and it was Absolutely awful. It was a disaster and of everything of like that... magnitudal note. Yeah. So thank <laughs> we're it's still a little sensitive. So um, I, this happened to bubble up. I think Representative John Burt had posted something, and I was like, oh, that's right there. I don't even have to do anything. So um, there is, if you go out to, um, I'm assuming that if you go out to the New Hampshire General Court, this is located someplace. This is for the House of Representatives. Um, there's a document, Public Guidance for Remote Committee Meetings. Um, it at, tells you how to register to voice support or opposition to a bill, because I don't know if you're aware, but when we were in real life, um, you would go up to the committee room, you'd find the committee room that has the bill you want, and they'd have a blue sheet, and you'd sign in whether you were for or against a bill, and if you wanted to speak, you filled out this little card. Well, you can't do that if you can't go to the state house, because they don't let people in the state house still, correct? They let reps in, but not a schmucks. So, so it's not really our house. No. So you can go on. There's a form you fill out, and you, you know you find the bill, and you do the drop down, and you select all whether you're a lobbyist or a person, and all this stuff. Which I I actually like this I idea. I love all of this because and I you like know the what? Remote I would, testifying. Well, there's a couple things. When I was a state rep, one of the things that bugged the bejesus out of me was people would fill out that sheet. And then the clerk, basically, on most committees, the clerk would just take those sheets and put it in the folder of the bill. Well, what was the point? Right. Nobody, we didn't know how many people were in favor, how many people were against, which people were in favor, which people. Yep. So I remember when, well, when I was on labor, we asked our our clerk, our assistant if they could scan it and give it to us. Just so I, you could see, because if it's the same 12 people signing every bill, you know, then you're like, okay, but are there other people who care? Um so in this case, you fill out this form. Um, they recommend that you do it w ahead of. Yes, like hours. Like at hour, least, at least because they're going to give the names of the people who want to speak. Because you can check a box if you actually want to speak. If you don't want to speak, don't check the box because it just cut, mucks up the system. So they give that list to the chair a half an hour before their committee meeting is to start. So if you give the, if you sign up 20 minutes before your name's not on the list, the chair will call at the end of all the testimony. Is there anybody who st wishes to be heard? And you can raise your hand in Zoom, which apparently we learned on Saturday is not as easy as everybody thinks it is. Um, but it explains how to do that because that it was very, I was glad to see that they took the time to explain how to do the things that you need to do in order to do it. Um, so it, it, it is a good process. I actually, in Here's the long term, have no problem with people testifying remotely forever and ever and ever. I don't like the idea that the, the legislators aren't meeting together mm. because uh, this was my gut feeling, and I talked to somebody on Saturday, and they said the same thing. It's one thing to be there to vote. It's a whole nother thing that you're there to have discussions with people, yeah. including your fellow legislators, because... How else can a legislator talk through a piece of legislation if you're nowhere near anybody to talk? So if, you're, if, they're, if your state rep is sitting home in their kitchen by themselves, only talking to people who agree with them. Yeah, we're back to those echo chambers. Right? <laughs> they're not actually there representing you because I'm guessing that you wouldn't just base your opinion just on people, on what is in your head. Well, and the thing is, you know, it is the 21st century. Technology. It is, right? Technology. technology exists. Um, and so in the same way that I feel like there are these massive opportunities for school choice mm -hmm. and we're seeing that, you know, we have the education freedom accounts. I think that's going to actually radically improve everyone, mm -hmm. including school teachers' exactly. lives, um, if we get this right. So so with that, I I, I like the, I can make a mug, I can have my sweats yep. on, well, I, I mean, can, you know, wait my I turn, mean, I can do it. six How other things. How many times have you been in Concord testifying on a bill? And I mean, it's a Where lot. they waste your time right. for hours well, and or, hours or and you hours. Get there, you know, you got to drive and it's winter and it's right. February and it's snowing and you want to drive and it, I mean. Well, for, or they let, you know, the 20 state agents yeah. testify for the entire session and then the 150 children, true story, yeah. who came to testify, they're like, 
Sorry, Sorry no we more ran time. out of time. You guys well, should come back in a few days. And like, we're spoiled because we're only 18 miles, right? So, I mean, it's not that big <laughs> yeah, of a deal. North Can you imagine people. if you live yeah. in, you know, Newport, New Hampshire, and you and you really feel strongly about something and you want to do more than just send an email? Um, and to be honest, you don't know if those legislators are here are reading those emails. You, people say, well, you can make phone call, you can call people. A lot of legislators don't answer their phone. Um, and for good reason, because there are, I mean, they can't, they're not making, this isn't a full-time job for these people either. But imagine if, you know, Mary out in Newport could get, sign up to be, testify three minutes on Zoom without having to find a daycare for somebody to yeah. watch her kids and her husband's got to leave his car home yeah. because hers can't drive to Congress. You know, there's well, so well, many so things. Here's the thing. I, I mean, I'm actually leaning strongly towards uh, trying to figure out. In fact, after Saturday's uh, debacle, debacle, we'll just call it that, I actually reached out to Joe and I said, hey, if you guys want help figuring out a system that could work, that maybe we even attach to the blockchain technology so that we can start to make everything. No one back home has to understand no. anything about any of this. <laughs> you just have to know it'll work. But basically the blockchain is an unimpeachable mathematical formula that allows you to create a ledger yep. where, you know, like in accounting, you have both sides of the books. So where you can create a ledger that is public where people can just simply see what, is recorded. So we could have roll call votes for every single vote that every single uh, legislator takes. It could be automated so that you could literally just go to a dashboard and look at, you know, like the work that so many nonprofits and Dude, so many why people is, why isn't it are just doing being done? can just be automated. We just need an appetite for it. Right, because it and, is. you know, if you've got an 80, how old's Lou D'Alessandra? 83 year old? I mean, does the gentleman even know how to email? I don't know. But I can tell you, if we could get the right kind of people in office, we can actually create tools that will make it better for yeah. everyone. Because back to the right of right to know issues. So many of these town town clerks and stuff, right. first of all, the laws keep changing, right? We keep tweaking them here and here and here. Second of all, I looked this morning, the, the memo from the Justice Department from 2015 is 138 pages right. long. So this part-time right clerk is going to... So everyone yeah. just kind of goes, ah, I, I, I don't, don't know. So. so I'm just going to say no, right? Which is, you know, when you can get away with it, right. it's it's the parental default right. of because well, I say so. you don't so. even know if the person working in that clerk's office was told by somebody else, maybe they're select, a selectman or the town council, whatever, that just deny them all. Right. We don't know. So, so, um, so what we do know, though, along the trend of, Good news. Uh, we did have a super duper awesome decision that came out of the New Hampshire Superior Court last week. I think it came out on Friday. And basically, for those who've been following along, it's this Sol Sol Ketty case, Marianne. Anyway, it's Marianne. That, so, so it's that Sal case. We, Sal we, I we, don't know. We've talked about it on the show in the past, but basically it was the professor from Keene State who is a journalism professor. She was trying to teach her kids, oh, New Hampshire has a super awesome right to know laws. We're really accessible. We're not. And um, and so she, as part of their project, the year-end project was these five students filed right to know requests with the city of Keene, and they were and probably they, harmless. I mean, they were they were things like uh, things that students would care about. They were things like excessive force by police. Of course, they were going to hide that information. Um, it was how many times do they arrest underage drinkers or how many times do they, you know? So it was very sort of things you would expect a college mm -hmm. student to be interested in, right? So I love this example because it's just at its heart, it's like all of those things, yep. right? It's like our media and our journalists aren't supposed to feed us fake news. They aren't supposed to give us opinions. They are supposed to give us the facts, right? So, um, and then our government is supposed to be open and transparent and, and tell us what they're up to. And then we're supposed to sort of monitor these folks because they're all supposed to be working for us. And then, you know, things are supposed to work. Now we know there is a fat, you know, massive disconnect with all of that. The media is lying to us. They've been politicized. They're doing stuff. And, and poor journalists and 
poor students, right? So this decision came out, and the judge said uh, basically that we're going to have to apply a balancing test. So instead of just saying blanket, no, you can't get these things, we're going to start to say, okay, I mean, sure, should we maybe redact whoever this person's maybe social the, security right. number? Or the, the name of the person who was arrested because they weren't convicted and, you know, okay. Right. So, so they're going to start to use this balancing test instead of just, you know, this blanket, hey, no. So basically what they're saying is when they do a, uh, so they're going to conduct a three-part balancing test to determine whether withheld records qualify for the exemption. So the balancing text test, that's like the told you show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the balancing test has three prongs. First, the court evaluates whether there's a privacy interest at stake that would be invaded by the disclosure. So right. does someone have some privacy? Right. Secondly, the court has to access the public's interest in disclosure. Right. Is this so sure, maybe you have a privacy right, but then you know, does the does the, the, the public, public have a more important right? And then third, the court balances the public interest in disclosure against the government's interest in non-disclosure mm. and the individual's privacy interest in non-disclosure. Importantly, if no privacy interest is at stake, then the right to know law mandates disclosure, which I think is really cool. Right, right? because what is the government doing that doesn't impede somebody's personal information right. that they can't tell you. So, so or won't some tell you some of the red herrings I actually heard last week uh, when we finished the show here and after our coffee, I went and I testified on some right to know bills, and um, and it's a Senate bill, and I'm really annoyed that they're even trying to do this because we have made a lot of inroads, and it feels like. There should be an appetite right mm -hmm. now, given the fact that there's, you know, people want police reform. We realize there's a problem. Now is an opportunity. So for them to introduce a Senate Bill 39 is annoying. But one of the red herrings that came up there is, but you're going to release police officers home addresses, their blood types, their uh, their psychological reports, their medical, what? and I was like, Who's oh my God, for that? Nobody. the nonsense. No, because, right, so, I mean, I think the people who are testifying uh, uh, along those lines, no, they don't have a leg to stand on, so now they're just trying well, to, like, scare. Oh, you know, make yeah, it sound like, bad. oh, you know, police officers are gonna get doxxed. I mean, besides the fact, as someone, who got arrested and had their photo on like the front page of the newspaper, which is how the board of the company I was working for at the time found out. found out, you know, I was not convicted or charges were dropped. And in fact, I was in the right and right. prevailed over the long term. But I'm like, you know, no one Nobody gives ever... me those privacy That's rights right. when, you know, it goes the right. other way. So, you know, police officers are actually tasked with using deadly force they should be held to the highest yes. standard and they're public po employees they work for us this isn't you don't work for the government the government works for us well yeah? do they they're in theory. that's the way it should be anyways <laughs> so anyway so the good news because it's always nice to be able to report back. You know, we do so much activism and there's so much stuff that you're involved Doesn't in. Doesn't go and then, but the, and, the good stuff you know, happens. it's a slog and a slog and a slog. So I feel like we are moving in the right direction. So I'm pretty excited. Unless SB 39 passes this session, in which case Carla will spend months complaining <laughs> on this show. Because you know what? Let's let's have an appetite to do the right things. Like, you know, people have had a rough time. We've had a rough year. Yep. It's, you know, the country's been mad for, you know, a long time. Let's, let's start afresh. Let's like realize, oh, there are some problems. We should fix them. How can we do that? So I did completely unrelated, but we have like five minutes. So I just want to mention a couple things. So I did do some math this morning because I saw something bubble up in my social media feed about 200,000 more since Friday, since so four days ago, 200,000 more Granite Staters have signed up to get the vaccine. I have no intention of getting the vaccine myself, but I'm glad to know that 200,000 people who do want it have signed up. We've already, other than those 200,000 people, um, the number I could find this morning was um, close to 86,000 New Hampshire residents have at least received the first dose. 
So if you took those two numbers and there's a 1.36 million people in New Hampshire, it looks like about 21% of the state at this point wow. have either started the vaccination process or are signed up to start the vaccination process. So numbers should be dropping significantly over the month of February. Well, you think. see what's going to be so interesting too is the timing of all of mm. this is is, you know, if I was an evil genius, I'd be like, wow, I wonder if they plotted that. But anyway, so my point is we know that the flu curves and the coronavirus curves look very similar to flu curves. They're just moved yep. a little on the timeline. But we know they do a certain shape yep. based on where you are in the season. And what we are actually going yep. to see is, is the normal drop, normal drop right. is going right. to coincide with when vaccines take off. And then there's going to be a false claim that, that these two a... things are highly related you know in what? a way that they're not. You know what's funny? Fine, I'll give you. I'll give them that because I just want people to be able to live their lives again. I've been living my life pretty much normally, other than the, having to wear masks places. Right? I, Dan, and I still go out to eat. We still visit with our friends. We still have company. We we go to events. We do yeah, things. I mean, we slides. do whatever we can do. We are not. We went on vacation. We'll go on vacation again. All that stuff. Um, I'm just for the people that are more worried. Oh, if you uh, want the vaccine, right? Have but it. I'm, if, if you want to wear a mask, have <laughs> at it. Just don't make other people right. do so, things. So, I mean, they, you if you the numbers are going to plummet for any reason, at least people can get back to normal. Another interesting little, just to put it in perspective, because people don't always know, when you ever you, if you have hear about uh, beds in hospitals, so New Hampshire has three thousand and fifty-seven inpatient hospital beds in the state. Um, the peak patient, not COVID, the peak patient use of beds was at 2254 in the middle of December, to just in general. And then the COVID bed use, which is based on 307 people that they knew had COVID and a total of 346 because some of those other ones might have had COVID. They had symptoms, so they're just presuming that they're positive. But that peaked on January 5th. So we're now, you know, two to three weeks behind that, behind that peak hospital. But even at that point, we were still only at 10% capacity with COVID patients. So when people go, oh my God, we're going to overrun the hospitals, even if our numbers were to go back up, even when it was at its worst this winter, to be honest, we were only at 10% capacity. For whatever reason, the virus, of we've course, learned about the virus, we've learned how to treat to the think. virus. Um, yeah. That and they canceled the St. Patrick's Day parade. Yeah. I don't think that's because just because of crowds. I just think there's nobody marching in parades, and that's why they probably canceled it. Because what bands are marching? I I mean, so uh, that's unfortunate. Um, I do know there's plenty of places that will be serving corned beef and cabbage, so you can still well, celebrate. Hopefully they'll be open, right? And, because I mean, that was the start of the devastation. Yes. I mean, a lot of St. Patty's restaurants lost tens of thousands yep. of dollars Keep on that Murphy. one day. You Imagine know, how hard it is to sell 20, uh, 2,000 pounds of corned beef when your restaurant gets shut down the night before St. Patrick's Day. And you've already paid $10,000 worth of liquor and 2,000 pounds of corned beef. And so other good news, uh, it sounds like the schools may be sort it's of halfway open. open. I, I don't have kids, so it's hard for me to follow. Well, let's just remind folks back home that homeschool parents, as well They've as all the parochial all and all the Catholic and all the religious schools have been open. It's been fine. It must make Daycares you question why people who have a union who are protected, who protect bad behavior, somehow didn't have the fortitude to do what everyone else managed to do. Ta-da. Ta-da. Yeah, that's all we got for this week. We're going to run out of time. So um, buy Carla's book. You can find it online. The Ecstatic Pessimist. I have to think about that. <laughs> um, if you have any subject matter you want us to talk about or information you need, please, by all means, email us at manchtalk at gmail.com. Um, we'll upload this on YouTube, and you can watch it on local access television for the rest of the week. And that's all we got. We'll see you next week. Bye, guys. Bye.